Hi everyone, it's Kayla, and I just wanted to drop in at the beginning of this week's episode and let everyone know that One Nation Under Crime is taking a vacation next week, and there will not be a new episode on April 4th. Uh, We will be back to our regular schedule on April 11th, but there isn't going to be one next week as we are taking a much-needed vacation. If you miss us that much and you can't go a week without us, you are always welcome to go to Patreon and check out the USBS episodes that we have there as well as all of our bonus content. You can go to patreon.com slash one nation under crime. Now on to this week's case. You are listening to One Nation Under Crime, a historical chronological true crime podcast. Each week we go through our nation's history and discuss one case from each year Starting in 1800, I'm Kayla. And I'm Leah. We have crept closer to episode 50. Creep, creep, creeping. And I greatly hope that our Patreons enjoyed getting their last episode a week early. Um, You could also get special surprises like that and such by going to patreon.com and searching for us. So... We would greatly appreciate it. You do get a shout out on the show. You also get goodies in the mail and certain things of the like. So you also... And our undying love. That too. I mean, you have it, but it's more like cemented. Um, Right. You know, it's kind of like the difference between dating and marriage. Um, (laughs) You're dating (laughs) us now. Um, So, you know, but we're okay with it. It's fine. put a ring on it. You know, I mean, hey. Just saying. You also, um, as a Patreon subscriber, you'll sometimes get bonus episodes that that are completely separate from this. It's not um, like this month we did um, everyone getting an episode a week early um, because it was a two-parter. And then, but we do have two episodes on the Patreon right now that even if you subscribe right now, you'll still get those episodes. Yep. Um, so... We do have times where we'll cover, we do what we did back in December, USBS, on the Patreon. So we do have a couple of episodes there um, that have that. And so if you want to go there, go. Um, It is fun. You can also talk to other people who listen to the podcast on there. It's kind of like a Facebook group without being a Facebook group. Um, But you can go do that as well. So, we're going to dig into it this week. And this, I had to surprisingly dig for this case, hmm. which I say surprisingly, and you'll, you'll kind of, you'll see why in a bit. Um, and I almost missed it because there is stuff on it. But there is something else that overshadowed it. Even she likes the buildup, guys. Yeah, even though the thing that overshadowed it was like years later. So, hmm. our sources for this week we have encyclopedia.com, <laughs> um, historical crime detective, aka. That's fun. Oh, I know we talked about it before. That yep. should be my name, that but it's already taken. Um, that's like my alter ego, I guess. Uh, no, it's my everyday one. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> and then museumhack.com. I actually got some really good information from that website. I've never used it before and I've never seen it before. So Museum I was pretty. Museum hack. Museumhack.com. So, um, it was a pretty interesting one. So we are in the year 1842 this week. And let's get into our events. January 1st, the first illustrated weekly magazine was published in NYC. Don't ask me the name because I didn't see it. January 2nd, (laughs) the first U.S. wire suspension bridge opened for general traffic in Pennsylvania. January 22nd, Charles Dickinson arrived in Boston, Massachusetts with his wife, Caroline, from Liverpool. There you go. February 15th, the first adhesive postage stamp in the U.S. was made by a private delivery company. Those are very handy. Mm -hmm. Now you don't even have to lick them. Mm -mm. I know. 
I know, but this was the one, this is the first one that you could lick and stamp. Hmm. So, I mean. Or p- apply to a wet sponge. Yes. Which I prefer. <laughs> February 21st, the first known, first known mm. sewing machine patent was filed in Washington, D.C. by John Greeno. I was going to say singer. I know, I, which is very weird because it's the first, it, they made it very specific to say the first known yeah. patent. Because remember, the patent office burned down a That's few years true. ago. <laughs> That's true. And they weren't numbered, nope. you know. So, but, but yeah, because, you know, all the old sew machine things that you see, like the old tables and all that, I they're all things. Mm-hmm. They're so cool. They're, you know, they're all singers. Most of the ones that you see commonly are singers. Man, you want to talk about getting some good calves. <laughs> but, I mean, you have to. Is that how your legs. husband did it? Is that how he did it? He's just born that way. I mean, I'm just saying. But yeah, it's, yeah, you have to, those are interesting. Um, I had a relative that has one in their house um, Mm -hmm. that actually like the sewing machine flips over and it becomes just the desk. And then, so it's really cool. Um, Just one of those interesting things that you never really expect to see. But I have a family, I have a family, um, bunch of family members that like really like antiques so Mm -hmm. that's where all of that comes from um march just march no real day the the massachusetts supreme court made strikes and unions legal in the united states huh march 3rd also in conjunction with massachusetts The first child labor law regulating working hours for children was passed in Massachusetts. Well, good. (laughs) I mean, took them long enough. It became a serious problem, though. I mean. I mean, I get it, but it's it's like, really? Yeah. First of all, they're children. That, I feel like we could gloss over that, though, because that's obvious. Like, yeah, children should not vote. I, but, I hey, I'm very thankful that those have been put mm-hmm. in place, though. Mm-hmm. Um, and that it's the law that your children have to go to school now. Yes, that is, that is, yes. Um, March 9th, the first documented discovery of gold in California occurred oh. in Rancho San Francisco, which sparked just a small this was not the big gold rush this was it's a it's not small the first one. gold it's rush not in the first US either. either go to our patreon um but yes it sparked a small gold rush and this was actually when um people from mexico cuz where it is on the this coast it's at the it's bottom kind of tip so yeah a lot of people were coming up from mexico um march 30th Dr. Crawford Long used ether for the first time as an anesthetic in Georgia. Hmm. June 15th, John C. Fremont and Kit Carson set off on the first expedition of the Oregon Trail. Oh. Did they get dysentery? Did they cross I was just the about to say they, they died of <laughs> dysentery, probably. <laughs> One of Any, the best games ever. Anytime you turn around an Oregon Trail, you die of dysentery. Um, or you sink crossing the river. I, I mean, is, or you lose half of something. Anyway. I, I love playing that. These people. August 1st, the Lombard Street riot erupted in Philadelphia during... People are garbage. Uh-oh. A riot erupted in Philadelphia during a parade which was celebrating the end of slavery in the Caribbean. It was a race riot that lasted (laughs) three days, and it was the last in a 13-year period of frequent racial attacks in the city. (sighs) Garbage. Um, Yeah, I mean, like, what city was that? Philadelphia. So for 13 years before this, there were constant 
attacks. And then, like, they're just having a parade for the celebration of the end of slavery in the Caribbean. Like, I mean, isn't that something I to mean, celebrate? In Pennsylvania, you were in the north at this time. Anyways, I, it's, I understand times are different, whatever. Still, people can be garbage. Um, August 9th. This was interesting. The U.S.-Canada border was defined by the Webster-Ashburton Treaty. So they actually finally established the line. I mean, um, they didn't know where it was before then? Remember, they had the pork and beans war. <laughs> so, you know. Root and toot and time. I mean, that's I'm what sorry. they named it. So, um, August 31st. The U.S. Naval Observatory was authorized by Congress. November 9th, the first design patent for typefaces and borders was issued to George Bruce. Hmm. November 22nd, Mount St. Helens in Washington erupted. There you go. I think mm. that happened in 79, same year I was born, I think. Well, this is years before that couple but I, I i think that happened again around the time the mm-hmm. time that i was born but I, I think it happened in 1979 i don't remember i wasn't alive i wasn't thought of um yes well i just just something <laughs> triggered in my brain november 26 the university of notre dame was founded december 7th can i tell you something Sure. I'm, I'm not a Notre Dame fan, but I do love their shiny helmets. True. December 7th, the New York's Philharmonic put on its first concert ever. Hmm. Which I bet was just interesting. And then an undated event for this year that also ties back to our Patreon. The Secret Society Scroll and Key was established as the second secret society at Yale University. The first. Was, we know about the first. Yes. So, just saying. But the second secret society, Scroll and Key, was established. Does their headquarters no. have, they don't mm-hmm. have windows either? No, they, like, they, it doesn't look the same at all. Okay, that's what I was yeah, about it's to ask. Completely, does, does it have windows? Completely because... different. Um, go to our Patreon if you want to know more. But, on to our births in 1842, January 11th, William James was born. He was an American philosopher, historian, and psychologist. He was the first educator to offer a psychology course in the United States. Oh. I thought that was really cool. He was a Capricorn, but psychology yeah. Psychology was one of my favorite classes I, lo- I took. Well, I mean, here I am uh, making this <laughs> podcast, so... I love psychology, but yeah, he was the first, William James, the first educator to offer a psychology course in the U.S. Thank you. Yeah, I know. You know, took a while for a lot of people to catch up. Thank but, you, sir. But, you know, we we appreciate now. you. June 24th, Ambrose Gwinnett Bierce was an American short story writer, journalist, and poet. His book called The Devil's Dictionary was named as one of the 100 greatest masterpieces of all time for American literature. Well, okay then. Never heard of it, but he has cancer. Kind of a long title. Well, it's The Devil's Dictionary. Oh. But it was named as one of the 100 greatest masterpieces of all time in American literature. So, So has a a long... A long uh, moniker. There you go. Um, Deaths in 1842... March 13th, Samuel Ells, he was the founder of the Alpha Delta Phi fraternity. And our other death for the year, December 1st, Philip Spencer, he was the founder of the Chi Psi fraternity. Oh, well. (laughs) Yeah, it was, I thought that was funny that they, every, yes, there were other people in this year, guys, they were all politicians um, for different states and different (laughs) terms. And I was like, "Mm, um. None of them stood out. Not a one. Um, so, on to our case for this week. April 19th of 1842. The American passenger ship known as the William Brown 
sank off the coast of Newfoundland, killing 31 passengers on board. You may be asking yourself, how is this a crime? We'll get there. How many survived? You'll see. The survivors are the reason why this is case. So. Okay. This is an interesting case for several reasons. This case will sound familiar to most of you, but for another reason. Stick with me. I have talked about this odd dichotomy several times where there are events that are very similar that occur in history. And one is virtually forgotten. And typically, when we go back, like we've done now, what we thought was the first ends up being the second. It's like the Titanic. If you're confused, let me put it this way. The William Brown is the Titanic 70 years before the events on the Titanic occurred. So 70 years after this took place, the Titanic occurred and everyone forgot about the William Brown. Huh. Yeah. So we have a lifeboat issue. Oh, that does not even compare to oh, what the issue becomes. No. But yes, we have major issues. So yes, this is kind of the first in the series that happens of ships that sink. And the William Brown was one of the first. So you could say it was the original Titanic. Because, I mean, because, you know, everybody knows like the Titanic was like 1910. 12. Okay, 1910, 19, 12. Yeah, so, somewhere around there. And that's, if you are a Downton Abbey fan, that is when this, this whole series starts with the sinking of the Titanic. And that's kind of how you know what the time period is, mm-hmm. is with the sinking of the Titanic. And you know where you are in history. Mm-hmm. So that's interesting that this has you know, this has happened before. Well, and because that's so well known. Right. And so when I saw, that's what I was saying when I was seeing this and I said that I, I almost did not see this case. I almost, I couldn't find much on it and I almost didn't even see it because mm-hmm. I'll get into that in a second of why th- this case was kind of hard to, to find and everything. But it's, This case actually ties to, like, a crime, but this happened 70, 70 years before the Titanic. So why didn't we fix all these things? And what happens in this case, just hold on, guys. That's the lifeboats are a trend. Always. So, yes, and Titanic, one of the best movies. I'm just going to (laughs) say it's amazing. Hot hot take. I don't think Leo is that good looking. I don't think he's as good looking as now. I don't think he's as good looking as people say that he is in this movie. I think he played his part well. For this time, but my favorite character has always and will always be the unsinkable Molly Brown. Um, yes. You know that she is, her character is actually a real person. A real person. Um, yeah. And the Titanic was the second. No, no, no. The first or the second in the series of three ships that she was on that went down and she survived all of them. 
Um, she's just an amazing person, period. There we'll talk play about, her. about her. Yeah, we'll talk amazing. about her. She's very, very interesting. Um, but yeah, we will we will talk about her um later on. So the other thing that makes this case interesting is because while the trial was in the United States, the crime itself occurred on the high seas. The trial is one where the court upheld the statute that self-preservation is not always a defense to homicide. You may be asking yourself, how can self-preservation not be a defense for homicide? Better question, how is it a defense? I mean, that, that, whole, that whole little part you just said was very confusing to me, my friend. I follow you, but it's it's just wow. What mm-hmm. that's so, crazy. How can self preservation even be like? What is this? What is how did someone get in trouble? It's insane. So March thirteenth of eighteen forty two, an American ship named William Brown, left Liverpool, England to head back to the United States, heading for Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. The William Brown was an American ship, and it was, in essence, making her way back home with all of the crewmen and everyone as well. In addition to her cargo, which we've discussed before, ships are are women. Anyways. Yes, yes. Mother Nature. We discussed this in one of our episodes as well. The USS Apervia. Um, and the Bermuda Triangle as well. We talked about that all in one episode. But in addition to her cargo, there were 17 crewmen and 65 passengers on board who were mostly Scottish and Irish immigrants. Again, sound familiar? Because there were a lot of immigrants that were on the Titanic as well coming over. Also Mm. Scottish and Irish. Mm. So, on the night of April 19th, the ship was 250 miles from Newfoundland when the William Brown struck an iceberg and began sinking Mm. rapidly. Sound familiar? Mm-hmm. And it was in April that the Titanic sank, too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, uh, oh, okay. So the Titanic was like copy and paste just on a larger scale. Okay, got it. Uh, well, got it. Okay. Got it. There were only two lifeboats on board. One small one that was known as the Jolly Boat. The Jolly Boat? The Jolly Boat. I would boat. like to be on the Jolly Boat, please. No, you wouldn't. Um, <laughs> you wouldn't want to be on the Long Boat either because that's what the other one is called. It's a large one and it's called the Long Boat. The captain, the second mate, and seven of the crew and one passenger took the Jolly Boat. One passenger. And 32 passengers, the first mate, and the rest of the crew crowded aboard the Long Boat but there wasn't enough space on the longboat for all of the passengers. Was there more room on the jolly boat? It was a smaller boat and it was already full. I mean, I didn't know if it was full or not. The remaining passengers on board pleaded with the captain to be allowed on a lifeboat, but the first mate, Francis Rhodes, told them, quote, poor souls, you're only going down a short time before we do. Oh. Yep. Only one hour later, the William Brown sank and 31 passengers died aboard. Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. So basically he just said, bye. He said, um, we're probably not going to make it either. So, like, you're just dying a little bit before us. So, bye. It gets worse. Um, Uh, You thought that that was the worst part. That's not, I mean, that is a terrible part. Uh, It gets worse. So, how is this a crime? Just wait. Charming. First mate, 
Francis Rhodes, Alexander William Holmes, and another seaman commanded the large lifeboat with the passengers. The passengers were still dressed in their night clothes and were freezing, which was only made worse by the steady rain that seemed to not let up. Again, it happened at night when everyone was going to bed and ha- like everybody's just rushing to lifeboats, like mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Lit- copy and paste. Yeah, there I mean, you go. You can't stop and think. You just got to go, 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 go. Yep. So. The two lifeboats stayed together through the night, but the captain of the William Brown, George Harris, thought they would have a better chance of survival if the two boats took two different directions. Why? Who knows? But he's the captain, so they have to listen to him. First Mate Rhodes told Captain Harris that his boat was overcrowded and already starting to leak and that some people would have to be thrown overboard to keep it from capsizing. I say we we just chunk, you know, chunk old first mate out. Say, why don't you just try to swim? Captain Harris said, quote, I know what you'll have to do. Don't speak of that now. Let it be the last resort. Ugh. Throughout the day of the 20th and into the night, the rain and the waves just got worse. The boat was taking on more water despite constantly bailing water out of the boat. And they were in danger of hitting floating ice at any moment. Mm. Around 10 o'clock that night, first mate Rhodes cried out in despair. Quote, this work won't do. Men, you must go to work or we shall all perish. Alexander Holmes and the other crew began throwing people overboard. (sighs) The first four men that were thrown overboard were named Riley, Duffy, Charles Conlon, and Frank Askin. The next two to go overboard. How did they choose? How do you choose? The next two to go overboard were Askin's sisters. But the evidence is conflicting as to whether they were thrown or whether their sacrifice was an act of self-devotion to their brother. It was admitted that when Holmes, and he, Holmes is our main character of this story. We will, we'll discuss him. That Holmes sees the brother and the sisters expressed a wish to follow him. Askin struggled violently and the fact that the boat was not deteriorating rapidly in the struggle was used against Holmes afterward. Keep that in mind. However, they only chose single men and they left the married men on board. Many asked to pray before being cast into the sea, but once their prayer was over, they were thrown off. I cannot imagine. Holmes tried to put a stop to it by saying, quote, no more shall be thrown over. If any more are lost, we will all be lost together. But regardless of his protest, the quote work that the first mate told everyone to do continued until 14 men and two women were forced off the lifeboat. Oh, my goodness. Want to be even more mad? That happened at 10 o'clock at night on April 20th. Oh, no. The next tell me they were found in like the a next hours. day was the morning of April 21st, and the weather had finally let up. The longboat was spotted by a ship named the Crescent, and they were all rescued. And I put, well, the ones that weren't thrown off the night before were rescued. Jiminy Crickets. That's all I can say. What? Jiminy Cricket. That's all I can say. That's, that's all I can say. I just... That, Captain Harris... Senseless. Yeah. Captain Harris's jolly boat was rescued by a French fishing boat six days after that. The shipwrecked passengers were taken to Philadelphia, and the news of the fate of the William Brown was an instant sensation. 
When some of the passengers reached land, they immediately filed a complaint. Ah, uh, you think? The U.S. District Attorney William M. Meredith set out to charge Alexander Holmes and the first mate, Francis Rhodes. But first mate Rhodes had already fled the city and Alexander Holmes was tried alone. First mate Rhodes was never found. Ugh. Mm-hmm. The exact charges for Holmes for the murder, the exact charges originally for Holmes were for the murder specifically of Frank Askin. A grand jury refused to indict Holmes on that charge, so it was reduced to manslaughter. Holmes was prosecuted under an act that was passed in 1790, which said, quote, Any seaman who shall commit manslaughter upon the high seas on conviction shall be imprisoned not exceeding three years and a fine not exceeding $1,000. The trial began on May 13th. Holmes was charged with the unlawful but not malicious killing of Frank Askin. So that is the difference between murder and manslaughter. Mm -hmm. Manslaughter is, mm -hmm. is known to not be, quote, malicious. So that, that's the difference. But we'll obviously get more into it. Holmes actually did admit to throwing Askin overboard, but he maintained that his actions were out of necessity. His captain and second mate vouched for his character, noting that he was, quote, faithful to his duty and efficient in the performance of it, and citing examples of Holmes' bravery and benevolence while on board. During the trial, it was proven that Holmes was the last man to leave the wrecked William Brown. Well, and when he boarded the longboat, he found a widowed mother hysterically crying for her sick daughter, who was named Isabel, who had been left on the sinking ship. Holmes immediately climbed back on to the sinking ship and ran to locate Isabel. He finally found her, quickly tossed her over his shoulder, ran back to the longboat, climbed down the ship's side, and handed Isabel to her mother. Well, that was kind. With the exception of his shirt and pants, Holmes had given all of his clothing to the women on the boat and gave words of encouragement to the remainder of the passengers and crew. It was proven that first mate Rhodes lost courage after he commanded the passengers to be thrown overboard, and he turned the command over to Holmes, who immediately changed course. So he turned over everything to Holmes after he had already, they had already thrown people off, and the first mate was, like, in charge and forced them to do it. Mm -hmm. Then he's like, ugh, I've lost courage, and gives it to Holmes so that Holmes can take over. Mm. This change in course from when Holmes took over is what put them in the path of the crescent and in turn led them to being saved because they were not going in the direction that Holmes turned the boat to. Ah. Oh. the is important. Yes. The prosecution claimed that the circumstances did not justify the action taken, that many of the persons thrown overboard struggled violently, and as the boat did not capsize, there was little chance of that actually occurring. Basically saying, y'all struggled and the boat didn't flip over. So clearly the boat was not going to flip over yeah. because you were struggling. So that's their basis. That's where they, yeah. they land on that. The prosecution stated, quote, Holmes' defense is that the homicide was necessary to self-preservation. First, then we ask, was the homicide thus necessary? That is to say, was the danger instant, overwhelming, leaving no choice or means, no moment for deliberation? For unless the danger were of this sort, the prisoner under any admission had no right 
without notice or consultation or lot to sacrifice the lives of fellow beings. Holmes's defense lawyer countered, saying that in the dangerous circumstances Holmes was placed in, he was not required to wait until the last, until the last second to act in self-preservation. Quote, in other words, he need not wait until the certainty of danger had been proved past doubt by its results. Yet, this is the doctrine of the prosecution. They ask us to wait until the boat had sunk and they were in immediate danger. But everyone would have drowned. So, after the prosecution and the defense rested, Judge Baldwin gave the instructions to the jury. Although he recognized the principle that self-preservation was a defense to homicide and there were some valid points, he stated that there were some important exceptions. One of these exceptions was that when taking on the job of a crew member, the person had accepted the duty which implied that he or she would put his or her life at risk before risking the lives of the others on board. AKA when the captain goes down with the ship. That's true. That circumstance. However, somebody has to know how to manage the ship. We'll see. So, Judge Baldwin held that seamen like Holmes had accepted such a duty and that therefore self-preservation was not an adequate defense to charge to the charge of manslaughter. And he told the jury, quote, extreme peril is not enough to justify a sacrifice such as this was, nor would even in the certainty of death be enough. If death were yet prospective, it must be instant. The sailor is bound to undergo whatever hazard is necessary to preserve the boat and passengers, even to the extent of sacrificing his life. While it is admitted that sailor and sailor may lawfully struggle with each other for the plank, which can save but one, we think that if the passenger is on the plank, even the law of necessity justifies not the sailor take it. So essentially saying, if you have two sailors walk the plank, they can fight with each other all they want. And you can throw one of them off the boat all you want. But if you're justifying a sailor versus a passenger, the sailor automatically should be off the boat. Yeah. I mean, I, I see that. Because keep in mind, none of the crew were thrown overboard. Not yeah. one. Yeah. So. The trial lasted a week, and after 16 hours of deliberation, the jury found Alexander Holmes guilty. As the official report notes, the verdict was given, quote, with some difficulty and was accompanied by the jury's recommendation for mercy. Judge Baldwin sentenced Holmes to six months in the Eastern Pennsylvania Penitentiary and a 20 dollar fine which is about five hundred and forty dollars today so he got off pretty easy though he served his full sentence holmes was relieved of his fine and ultimately pardoned by president john tyler hmm. the alexander holmes trial dictated that seamen have a duty to their passengers and that it is superior to even their own lives his case is the one that set that in stone as a precedent for yeah, being on a set ship. Set that precedent, yeah. Holmes would eventually return to life at sea and remains the only sailor prosecuted in connection with the events that occurred after the sinking of the William Brown. Well, because I couldn't find the first mate. Mm hmm. Couldn't find anybody else. But there were other crewmen on that lifeboat and none of them were prosecuted either and they said themselves 
Holmes had no, he wasn't a first mate. He wasn't a second mate. He was just simply a sailor. Like he was part of the crew, but he yeah. held no standing. Like he held no. Yeah. He was doing what he was seniority. told to do by the seniority. And so if he could be tried, then it would stand to reason that the other sailors yeah. that were aboard could be tried as well because they stood by, even if they didn't push people overboard they still would have stood by mm -hmm. and could have been an accessory to a murder because they saw everything happen. And let's just go back to these 30 some odd souls who went down with this ship. Who owned this ship? Why were they not prosecuted for not having adequate lifeboats for all of those people who didn't See, even have a chance? And that would have been the captain. Did he own the boat? it still would have been on him to make sure that there were enough lifeboats to sustain the amount of passengers he was allowing on the boat. Well, I'm just saying somebody need, needed to have been taken. You know what I mean? Yeah. Somebody was at fault for so, that, for those people that didn't even have a chance to get on a lifeboat to be pushed out of. Well, and then my other question is, how do you stand there and you go, sir, are you married? Are you married <laughs> or single? Yeah. Second of all, if I ask to pray before I'm thrown off a boat, you better believe that is going to be in the Guinness Book of World Records as the longest prayer of all time before I am thrown off that ship. I would have made it because I would. They were like, "There's still this. She's still going." And then they're like, "Oh, there's a boat." <laughs> I mean, let me tell you, if I am given some kind of way to put off my death. And that, and they're like, yes, you can do your Catholic prayer because keep in mind, a lot of these are Scottish and Irish. You can do your Catholic prayer before. And they're like, Jesus Christ, this is the longest prayer of all. She's doing And they're the like, rosary. she's still done. Like she's, she's, she's not done. She's still going. We can't throw her off. Like, and they're stuck in like semantics of, we told her that when she was done, we would throw her off. She's not done. But it's been five hours. <laughs> At what point? <laughs> they're having like an existential crisis. And they, then they're they, like. They probably rushed they're like, them along. Oh, wait. There's a boat. They, they probably rushed them along. See, but what's interesting is that had Holmes not taken over, they would not have changed course. So it stands to reason. Uh, yeah. That if that hadn't happened, then everyone on board would have died. Right, which is why they showed mercy and why he got a pardon, I'm sure. Well, and I think, too, I think his actions in saving the little girl on the ship mm -hmm. by going back on to save her, mm -hmm. they had proof and they had people that did say, he, it, it, we were off the coast of Newfoundland in ice and rain, and he took off all of his clothes except his shirt and pants and he, gave them to the women on the boat yeah, and was trying to keep them warm. Like he was doing everything he could to keep people alive. And while it wasn't, while he did participate mm -hmm. in the throwing of people off the ship, that wasn't, it was, it, it was a direct, from him. right. It right. was a direct order to him. So I don't know where that lies on the scale of being culpable or not. Right. I, I don't know. I think it is one of those super unfortunate situations that, I mean, because like he said, like his attorney said, you are saying that no action should be taken unless they are in immediate danger. But that immediate danger is it's you're already late. out of yeah, the boat. It's too late. Yeah. So he was saying the immediate danger part of this, it's null and void because. We're, you have to do something before it gets to the point right. of an immediate danger. And so it's like, so what do you do? Yeah. And, but I found it was interesting, but this case is the case that kind of sealed into everything that sailors had a duty to their passengers mm -hmm. over their own lives. So that in turn is the captain going down with the ship. Right. That's what this turns into. Wow. So, so they fixed yes. that part, but they didn't <laughs> fix the whole lifeboat issue. Yeah, I don't know. We'll, we will cover the Titanic, obviously, but obviously that is 
around 70 episodes from now because it's 70 years from now. But, I mean, this is another, and we've talked about it before, and it is frustrating that this is another case of, I never knew about this. Yeah. And and something. Well, it wasn't on as grain of a scale. Mm -mm. Well, no, it wasn't. But it's like, I was researching it and I was going through it and I'm like, literally the same thing is happening. Like minus, well, we don't know if people were thrown off lifeboats, but I mean, the same, they hit an iceberg. It was in April. Mm -hmm. It was at night. There weren't enough lifeboats. Mm -hmm. Everybody is forced off the boat, like in their night clothes and nightgowns. So they don't have anything to keep warm. Like Mm -hmm. the ship goes down and people died on the ship. Like it's, it is, it is, it is crazy. It is the Titanic before the Titanic. So it it was just so interesting to me. It's like a small preview. Yeah. It's like, (laughs) Hey, Oh, here's where you should probably fix things. And they were like, you know what? We're good. I think, I think, I think we're good. We're just going to make the captain stay. And that's my thing too. Like you were saying is like, wouldn't someone need to be, but so someone would need to be on a lifeboat to maybe kind of know the sea enough to know which direction to go. Right. But then on that same hand, how do you decide who goes? Because normal thinking would think, oh, the higher up ranks should be, you know, would be the best ones to go. But then by this, no, they're supposed to stay on the ship because they need passengers on, you know, so it's like, so who gets on? Like, who who is going to help yeah. them? I mean, I know. Or do I they just, just, like, float around and hope which is that... Which what ends up happening. Hope that a Mosasaur doesn't come up and... <laughs> And take go. them down. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, saw the trailer for the new Jurassic Park. Ugh. It's going to be amazing. But everyone is in it. No, like Jeff Goldblum is in it. Everyone is in it. My daughter's going to have a heart attack because Ellie is in it. Like, <laughs> it is. Everyone is in this movie. So it's it looks like it's going to be really good. But. I'm just saying, and we, at this time, look, we don't know. Mosasaur could be down there. They just found out that Krakens are real, okay? <laughs> so I'm, a Kraken could have taken Release them. Release the Kraken. They could have just, like, w- they're real. We found out they're real. There's proof that they're real. So how do we not know that there's not a Mosasaur down in the depths of the ocean that can come up and on top of someone. I'm just ready to see a real mermaid. I'll be so excited. I mean, I don't think they're pretty. I, anyways, that's a whole other story. Don't, that's a whole other podcast for another day. Don't do that to me. Don't ruin it for me. Anyways, I'll try not to, but. We're not podcasting on mermaids. They don't look like the little mermaid. I can Stop tell you it. that. So. Shut your filthy mouth. I'm just saying. You never know. Krakens are real. Just saying. I, you, you don't even know what could come up next. Just saying. When I think about that, I have to think of logistically how could that work? And then I'm like, well. Mm-hmm. I mean, since 2019 and all the things that have happened, I'm just. We're, Nothing we're just, could, we're just surviving. Right. You know, not, there is abs. You could say some. Have you seen the people that you might not have that have made like 2022 bingo cards? <laughs> and they like put down in each like section what they think could like, happen. I mean, and then like th- it shows them like coloring off like, their bingo cards. Didn't have like, that on my bingo card. Yeah, I have seen those. I've seen. Yeah. So like one of them was Nick Jonas and um, his wife having a baby. And everybody's like, that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. End of January, they come out and say that they had a baby via surrogate and like all this other stuff. And it's just, it's like clicking through all these different things. Um, yeah, I have seen the memes that yeah, just said, you know, this happened. Oh, I didn't have that on my bingo. I card. mean, at this point, we cannot, we can't put anything out there and say it's not true because at this point, we do that. And then it's like, oh, Kraken. Okay. Well, this was fun. Oh, <laughs> this, this, this was fun, guys. <laughs> Which then makes you wonder, because everybody was in quarantine and all those things, do you think that they just got brave enough to come up because there weren't as many ships on the water? 
Well, I mean, while everybody was in quarantine, we know that wildlife did mm-hmm. come down into cities more. Like, it, it, mm-hmm. I did see, um, like, I think it was in Montana or somewhere, the, there was a street and there were, you know, elk just like mm-hmm. walking in the street because people weren't in the yep. street. So Kraken was like, hello, hello. Literally with their tentacles. <laughs> you can find, guys, just go to YouTube and Google real, like go on there. Don't Google it, but YouTube real Kraken, you'll find it. Um, real Kraken is what she said, not real crack. Real Kraken. Yeah. I mean, I just want to make sure. I don't want you to cracking. like do a misstroke and like. Well, you know. Just saying. You will not find the video of a real Kraken on our website, nope. but you can find a lot of things there. So you can go find it at one nation under crime.com. We are one nation under crime on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and at O N U C pod on Twitter. If you love our podcast as much as we do, and or we even know you more. Do, Please follow us everywhere. Recommend us to your friends, family, coworkers, and leave us a five star review. Five stars only on Apple Podcasts. Or recommend us to people on the street, in Whoever. the doctor's office, waiting room, grocery store line. Whoever. You know? Um, we do have a Patreon, as we said before. Just go to patreon.com and search for One Nation Under Crime. We thank you again this week for listening to this episode. Yes. I- I'll put something in the beginning. But next week, we are on a break. We were on a break. (laughs) So. Thank you so much for doing that. Next week, we are on a break. And we're going to take a week off, and then we will be back better than ever. But. Tag team back again. (laughs) We will be on a break and then we will be back um it's spring break here where we are so this is as good a time as any that i'm able to schedule everything out to where that works out so um while we will not see you next week we will see you here same time different crime in two weeks and remember there isn't always liberty and justice for all Nope. Especially if you're a Kraken and people thought you were extinct. Yep. Or a mermaid. Bye.